about the challenges they were facing. I even put part of my staff into negotiating with creditors because they owed money to various people and couldn't pay it because they had not had their wages paid to them. I worked individually with them to try to help them get by and talk to them about the challenges that they faced. You know, when you truly care about our families, you make sure no one is ever in this situation. And by the way, his labor cabinet figured out how to enforce the law. They simply sent some letters. It was that easy. If you're just happening by here on the half hour, you are watching the Kentucky debate from the <laughs> University of Kentucky, and it is lively tonight sure as is. Uh, we have our uh, uh, the candidates here tonight, to Matt Bevan and uh, Andy Bashir, and we're having an enjoyable oh, evening. Oh, it's uh, yeah, very lively indeed. <laughs> Halfway mark, continue. gentlemen. All right, next question is a student-generated uh, question. Came from one of the students here at the UK. With the right to work law in place in Kentucky. Uh, what will you do now to ensure that blue-collar workers, wages, benefits, and workplace safety are still a top priority uh, to be enforced by state government? And uh, Mr. Bashir uh, answers first. I believe in the dignity of work, that if you work a job uh, in a hard week, that you ought to be able to make enough to raise your family working just that one job. But for so many Kentuckians, we're falling further and further behind as wages are stagnant, but our bills go up every month. It's like my friend Laura, who's here tonight, who teaches all day long and then has to drive an Uber at night, and that is wrong. People should not have to have that second job after teaching just to pay the bills. I am against this governor's uh, so-called right to work for less that was passed, and I'll work to repeal it. I'm against uh, their repeal of the prevailing wage. I'm against his stripping the OSHA board that's supposed to protect our workers. I'm against the fact that his labor cabinet didn't investigate one workplace fatality for the first three years he was in office. Folks, I'm going to create a labor cabinet that doesn't spend time trying to investigate and find teachers, but protects those black jewel miners. Does its job. Please, Mr. Bevin, your response. Part of the operative part of the question is what are we going to do for workforce safety? What are we going to do to ensure that wages are increased? The workforce in Kentucky is as safe as it's ever been in recent decades. Based on the number of incidents, based on the number of deaths on the job, we have focused on this like never before under previous labor cabinets. As it relates to wages, what makes wages go up? Not the government dictating it. It's competition for people. It's the ability to people to have the skills and the things that they need in order to be able to compete, in this case, in the 21st century workforce. Interestingly, the states in which union membership, which was part of the question here, and what's going to be done for those with skilled trades? The states in which union membership are growing, and there's only a few in America in which that's the case, every one of them is a right-to-work state. Why is it? Not because it's a right-to-work state, but because when it is a right-to-work state, more businesses will come there, invest there, and hire people. And when they do, there are jobs for union and non-union workers alike. We need skilled trades. I've invested hundreds of millions of dollars since I've been governor in training people for skilled jobs that exist in Kentucky and in America. Mr. Bashir, a quick response. Creating the next generation of jobs, one that are going to exist uh, in an economy that is rapidly changing, has to be about vision, not just more of the same. It's time we invest in areas like Agritech, one of the fastest growing areas in the world, where we can create six-figure jobs all across Kentucky and not just in a couple of large cities. It's time that we focus on advanced manufacturing and robotics and AI, so there are jobs waiting for people who are losing their jobs on a line right now, and it's time that we fully commit to health care, one of the fastest growing areas of our national economy. Let's actually lead. What is Agritech? What are these fabled six-figure jobs that you're talking about? Give us examples of, of what people are going to do in agriculture. It's everything from the science in the sea, developing the seed that can withstand that flood we're seeing in the Midwest. It's the data analytics so we can uh, predict the weather patterns that are constantly changing. It's the technology on the tractor that helps you go in a perfectly straight line and analyzes every inch of soil as you go. So it's, the question, it's the drone that helps you to uh, make sure you can manage an acre and not just a field. We've got to increase yeah. our food supply 70% in the next 30 years just to feed the world's growing population. We're and investment in grew 80%. No, no, no. Hey, right. We've had three minutes from him. Let me say this. These are agritech jobs I was that you're just answering promising. The question. 
You're, no, you're not answering the question. The question is, what are we going to do for people who are in our skilled trades and for unions? And you're talking about things for which these people have neither training, nor are there any unions whatsoever representing those things you've just mentioned. I thought your there question was, none. what was Agritech? There are none. And so the question is this. No, my point is, you're talking Hold about on, things. On. You're offering a solution to something that's not a solution to the question that was asked. Okay. Well, we have another question about jobs okay. here. <laughs> so we can stay on this topic here. There are thousands of job openings in the state that currently cannot be filled, many of these in the urban areas. How do we match skills with job requirements and attract and retain young professionals to our state? Mr. Bevan? Again, doing the things that we've done since I've been governor. We've done several things, not the least of which is take $100 million and say to the local high schools, local post-secondary school, and the business community, work together and compete for some of those dollars. The state will not pay 100% of your idea. You need local dollars, local investment to get engaged. And indeed, we had $540 million worth of applications for $100 million. And so the state put up $100 million, private sector put up nearly $150 million. And in the last three years, we've put $250 million into workforce training for jobs in the urban and rural communities across the state. We looked at which areas we have the greatest need, healthcare, IT. We looked at construction trades, we looked at logistics, and we looked at advanced manufacturing. More than 100,000 open jobs, urban and rural, in those areas. And we've said, you apply for whatever financial aid you can get, and the state will pay the difference between what you're eligible for, no matter your need, and the cost of that for up to two years for certifications, for training, and or degrees to make sure that you are prepared and ready for jobs that exist and are looking to hire people right now. These are not hypothetical. These are things we're doing right now in Kentucky. Mr. Bashir. Well, I think the question showed that there's a problem, that we're not filling these jobs, and this governor's response is, well, let's just keep doing what we're doing. Folks, I believe in vision. I believe that we have to create the workforce of the future by stopping this fight between vocational and technical education and four-year college degrees. The fact is, we don't have enough kids in Kentucky getting either, and it's time we get every single child into one of those two paths. To do that, we can't just be talking to our high schoolers. We've got to get down into our middle schools. And we've got to talk not just to our students, but to their parents about the amazing types of jobs that are out there. To give people exposure into what type of jobs there are and how much that they pay. It's about investing in our classrooms because our teachers are preparing students for jobs that don't even exist. So funding for public education, absolutely critical to creating that workforce. I believe that our teachers are the original job creators. Here's what I'll say. You mentioned, you mentioned keep doing what we're doing. Everything that I said in my one minute was things that had never been done before in the history of Kentucky. I'm doing things that have never been done. We've taken dual credit training, which has increased by 75% year on year in the last three years, and we're no longer saying it's only applicable to two and four year degrees. It's actually applicable to getting things like welding certificates, getting your CNA certification, or whatever the case might be. It's about rethinking the way in which we meet the workforce where it is and not keep lying to people about how a four-year degree is going to be the ticket to all your desires in life because increasingly that isn't necessarily true. Mr. Bashir, quick response. Sure. In the last year alone, over 70 counties saw their unemployment increase. They certainly don't believe what we're doing is working. More than 82 percent of jobs this governor claims have been created and his administration have been in just two cities. And while I support those cities, I believe that every single area of this Commonwealth deserves good jobs. That's why I am focused on Agritech, because we can create jobs all over Kentucky, where people can grow up in their communities and work great job in those communities. They don't have to leave. They can choose to stay thank and you. raise their families right, right. there. Thank you, Jan. I want to counter, I want to counter the Quickly. lie that was just said. Let me, this is important. Number one, understand something. Oh. The lowest unemployment Kentucky has ever seen in history is right now. And these, I don't know if you're aware of the fact, but they measure this every month. And on any given month, unemployment does go up and down in different counties. But for the first time in the history of Kentucky, every single county in our state has single-digit levels of unemployment. We have more people going to work right. ever than in Time. the history of our state. We're gonna, please, next question. The, uh, the Kentucky crime rate and violent crime rate in Kentucky are below the national average, and uh, both rates are declining uh, in Kentucky, and uh, you can both be proud of that, uh, certainly in the capacities in which you currently serve. And yet our jails are overcrowded, 
and are unable to fully serve the needs of those who are imprisoned there. Uh, it, many of our counties are having woeful budget uh, problems as a result. Uh, what is the solution? We begin with Mr. Bashir. Well, as your Attorney General, I've worked hard every day to protect our families. Uh, I'm proud that our Attorney General's office has nearly tripled the number of child predators we've removed from our communities. And last year, we arrested more human traffickers than any two or three year period in our history. But the question on, on jail overcrowding is a real problem. And the, the driving cause behind it is addiction. Addiction is driving so many folks uh, into that system that aren't violent, yet we are sending them places that make them violent. We've got to make sure that if you are arrested for a possession crime or ultimately a nonviolent crime that is driven by addiction, we don't send you to jail, we send you to treatment. I've been honored to help fund and oversee the rocket docket here in Kentucky that gets people immediately into treatment and out of the criminal justice system. It saved us tens of millions of dollars every single year. But I tell you what, unlike this governor, I will never support private prisons. We will close the private prisons that he has opened in my term as governor because it is our duty to ultimately uh, take that role. Mr. Bevan. These prisons you referred to were largely opened under your father. I think that's what you're confusing with. But I'll say this. It's important to understand we've done several things. I agree on this. This is where we agree as well. In any, you go into any jail or any one of our prisons in this state, 75, 80, 85, 90 percent of the people that are in there are in there for drug-related uh, issues. We've done things with drug courts in the state funding that I've put into budgets that has more in funded this than any previous governor prior to me. But additionally, we've done things with our state police where we now have something called the Angel Initiative. You can have drugs on you. You can walk into any state police post in this state. And if you are yourself or someone on your behalf asking for help for you, you will have the ability to be given help. You will not be charged criminally. You will be given exactly what both of us are advocating for. We do need to be a lot smarter about reaching out to people that are in moments of addiction, and we need to do a lot better job about interceding and not incarcerating our way out of this. We are not providing the services in prison that they need, and it's important that we make sure we spend the dollars where we can get the greatest return on the taxpayers' investment. Okay, let's move on to our next question. Will you commit to fully fund the school safety bill passed by the legislature? And what other ideas do you have to ensure the safety of our students as well as those who work in schools? Mr. Bevan? Yes, I'll tell you, I'm a strong advocate for that bill, Senate Bill 1. I worked very closely with these families. I still wear a bracelet that was given to me by the parents of the two children who were killed most recently in Marshall County. This is something very real uh, to our families. I'll tell you this, though. We don't know exactly what that cost will be or what the solution is. We don't. If you notice, when the bill was signed, we talked about school resource offices. We talked about people being there to provide. We don't know what that is. Here's what I'm a proponent of. I'm a proponent of making sure that every student, every parent, every administrator, every teacher, every coach, every bus driver, anybody walking on or off of a public school property should have absolute confidence that they are as safe on that property as any other property that they might walk onto or off of, including that of their own home. And that means we better make sure not only that we fund it, but that we're intelligent about where that funding gets spent and to ensure that we have not zones that are known to be so free of anybody that would counter a threat that people see them as a target-rich environment. This is not helping our schools, our theaters, uh, or our other public places where Mr. Bashir, there's no way to protect. Every child deserves to be safe at school, and no parent should have to worry about their safety while they're there. Uh, these shootings we see in our schools tear at the very fabric of who we are as people. And while it might not be our children's school, I know we grieve with those parents who have lost. I also met with the parents of the Marshall County School shooting, and while I didn't go in front of the cameras, what I offered them was every resource of our office to help the prosecutors make sure that we secure justice um, in that situation and for those families. Now, this governor's had four years to fund school safety in a way that he simply hasn't. We've got to make sure that we are providing the funding for the physical plant safety. Our schools can't have four, five, six entrances. That's not safe. Each one needs the two doors that you got to be buzzed through, and every single school needs an SRO officer. I'm going to treat every single public school as what it is. One of the most important buildings in our entire Commonwealth, filled with our most invaluable investment. 
Mr. Bevan, do you want to respond? I will simply say this. The, the statement that I've not funded, we're putting more money into our public schools at the K-12 through level than we ever have in the history of Kentucky. More money per pupil and more in absolute dollars. And anybody who finds that to be a confusing thought doesn't understand that that's a factual, mathematical statement of reality. There's more money per students than any... Here's the thing. Please. Understand this. Group. Understand this. This is simple dollars and cents. And those dollars, many of them are used for things, including budgets that have gone in to provide. But this Senate Bill 1, which was the original question, will we commit to funding it? And the answer is yes. And this idea about posing for cameras, my gracious, you're the poster child of this. Mr. Bashir, did you want to respond? Yes. Uh, folks, that, that's not only not flat factual because you have to consider this thing called inflation, but just ask my running mate, Jacqueline Coleman. Did your Coleman, father do that? Assistant principal at Nelson County. Under his budget, she had to let go of 10 adults in that one building, meaning the same number of students would show up the next year with 10 fewer adults. His budget cut all of their instructional resources. No technology, no right, new textbooks. Time. This governor has not funded education. Our next question is a student question, and it is this. Eastern Kentucky is facing a water crisis right now in, in, in many of the uh, counties. Boil water advisories are very common throughout uh, that region of the Commonwealth. And for some households, water is not available at all. How do you plan to provide safe water for all Kentuckians? The initial response is from Mr. Bashir. Well, just like access to health care, access to clean drinking water is also a human right. It's part of the infrastructure that's required not only for our families to be prosperous, but to ultimately bring businesses to places uh, that we need them to be. It's why in Martin County, we put out a report showing that sadly, three separate times uh, that group that governs the Martin County Water District was given a plan that would have gotten them back to a point where those citizens would be served. It's because of that that I've recommended the most severe response, which is to bring in an outside receiver to finally get them clean drinking water. I'm going to do what this governor has not done. I'm going to declare a state of emergency. We're going to work for federal funds based on that state of emergency. We're going to make sure that every single child can bathe in the water that comes to their house and drink from the water that's coming out of their faucet. Mr. Bevan, the water out, question. You know, you're going to put out reports, and that's great, but I'll tell you, while you've been talking about putting out reports, we've actually been funding this. We've been doing exactly what you're saying that you'll do. We're working with state dollars, federal dollars. We're putting more money into Martin County in the last two, three years than had been put in in the previous 20 to 30 years as it relates to this issue. And we're not allowing it to go to corrupt places as has happened under previous administrations, but we're starting with a brand new board of the, overseeing the water and sewer district, but additionally, starting at the hub, start where the water source is, ensuring that it's clean, ensuring that the pumping is accurate, ensuring that the lines don't leak, and that we don't have bits in pieces of lines that are good in some places and not at the source. Start at the hub and work out with the spokes. We are addressing this. This is a big problem. It's as a result of many things, including the mining activities that have existed in these hills. But I will say this, while all the talk you have about caring about miners, you proudly bragged about you voted for both Obama and Hillary Clinton, who've made it very clear they hate coal miners and coal mining operations. Quickly. Quickly, Please, hang on. Quick response. It, quick is, response, wor it is worth quick booing. Quick response You're right. is that this governor failed our coal miners, those 200 black jewel miners. All he had to do was have his labor cabinet demand that bond, and each and every one of them would be protected. There's only one person on this stage that's failed our coal miners, and it's you, Governor. There's Bevel. only one. Hello. There's only there's only one person on this stage, uh, at least on this side of it that voted for Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. That's right there. All right, we have our, our le le next question. Hold Thank on, you. please. Kentucky is just one of three states with an election this year. The first presidential caucus is just three and a half months away. Is this race a referendum on national issues or will it be decided on state issues, Mr. Bevan? It's a combination of both. It always is in an off-year election. There's things that matter. What matters to us the most here? It's jobs. It's our economy. Is there more money in your pocket than there was before? Is your family happier? Is there more opportunity? Is there more competition for the skills that you have to offer? Those are things that matter to us. But you can bet that national level issues are also Kentucky issues. The security of our nation, whether we put our nation first, things like the life issue, 
Things like protection of our Second Amendment rights, the right to keep and bear arms, not being infringed. These things matter too. They can be called national issues, but guess what? They are near and dear to the people of Kentucky. So it is a combination of both. You will see this race be a proxy in many respects. This is one of only three races, and so issues talked about here are going to be talked about at the national level. And so I think it's important for us to focus on these and to be very intentional about the fact that things that we're fighting for are being discussed at the national level. And after this debate, you're going to see on national TV a bunch of people with some insane ideas that will cost you more money than you can afford and will take this country in the wrong direction. And one of these is the guy or woman that he's going to vote for in 2020. Thank you, Mr. Bevan. Mr. Bashir. Yeah, this race isn't about the White House. It's about what's going on in your house. It's those kitchen... It's those kitchen table issues that keep us awake at night. This race is about public education, pensions, health care, and jobs. Those critical issues to your family that if you are not satisfying them, you don't sleep at night and you don't reach those other issues. And on every single one of those issues, Matt Bevan has failed. On public education, he has attacked our teachers. On health care, he's trying to strip away coverage from 95,000 people. On jobs, just ask folks in eastern and western Kentucky. He's failed to fight for them. And on pensions, he tried to illegally cut the retirements of 200,000 public servants. With a record like that, I'd probably be talking about the national race, too. Here's the thing. But this, this race... But There's this race rebuttal. is about what's going on at your kitchen table. You know, and I tell you what, right. I will always be on Team Kentucky. I will always fight for you, and I will always focus All on right. those Mr. issues. Mr. Bevan, quick yeah. response. So, no, that was, that was my rebuttal time, so let me rebut the rebuttal to your own comment. Let me say this. There's not enough time for me to respond to all the lies you just stated. I will say this. One of the two of us will be the next governor, and we're either going to work with the president that we have in the White House, or we won't. I've made clear that I stand with this president. I will work with this president. I appreciate that he's putting America first. And Andy Bashir has made clear that he will work to undermine President Trump and that he actively opposes the policies of this president. I don't think he should be impeached. He does. That is a powerful difference. And it is important for the people out there voting to understand you're going to end up with a governor that works with the White House or a governor that will fight okay. the White House. Right. Thank you, Mr. Bevan. We are now going to turn to closing remarks. Each of you will have 60 seconds. So we drew for the order of the closing remarks, and the first uh, closing remark is from Mr. Bevan. You have a decision to make, one of the two of us, not part of me, not part of him, not part of us and somebody else. The bottom line is one of the two of us will be the governor for the next four years. Do you want to go forward, continue to move in the direction that we have been, where there are more people going to work, where there are higher wages, where we are doing more as it relates to changing the corrupt culture that has existed in this state, or do you want to go backwards? Backwards to the world, where people that work for this attorney general and his father are increasingly going to federal prison, who are being convicted month after month in going to prison. That is the backwards approach. Do we want to go backwards or do we want to go forward? I'm a military veteran. I'm a man who grew up in poverty, but I have lived the American dream. I'm a father of nine children. Four of my nine children are adopted. I care about these issues. And if I am reelected, I will continue to fight for this state like I would fight for my own family. And I will defend the Commonwealth of Kentucky on every stage the way I defended this nation when I wore her uniform 30 years ago. Mr. Bashir. Thank you. Hold on. The governor is, is right about We're not done, we're not done yet. Hold, we're not hold done it. yet. Please, please hold your Go, 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 go. So the governor is right about hold one us. thing. You do have go. a choice. It's a choice between someone who has bullied our teachers, given his buddies $370,000 jobs, treated state property like your state plane in the governor's mansion as his plaything, somebody that bought a mansion from a state contractor at half price. If he wants to see corruption, he can just look in the mirror. But folks... I want to bring us together. Enough of this us versus them. I want to be a governor for all Kentucky families that fights for each and every one of you, Democrats, Republicans, or independents, that believes that all of our families should be treated with decency and respect and actually shows that example as your governor. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you both candidates for taking part. We
would like to thank our sponsors, the UK Student Government Association, Great Television, and the League of Women Voters. The election is coming up on Tuesday, November 5th. The polls will be open that day from 6 a.m. until 6 p.m. Please be sure to vote. Thank you for joining us tonight. And now you now know you the applaud. applaud, all right? <laughs> Thank you.